I now invite the new prosecutor of the court, Mr. Karim Khan, to address us. The floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, uh, Vice Presidents, uh, Honorable Judges uh, of the International Criminal Court, Vice President of the Assembly of State Parties, Mr. Registrar, President of the International Criminal Court Bar Association, uh, my predecessor, Fatou Bensouda, uh, and Deputy Prosecutor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great honor to take this solemn decoration, but it's apt to recall that this magnificent courtroom, this building, and this office that I now lead can be viewed through two different prisms. First, it is an awful testament to the horrors of mankind that in this 21st century, as we send rovers to Mars, as we are about to commence space tourism, where we have managed to harness the powers of the sun, of the wind, and of oceans, in this 21st century, medieval crimes are being committed by modern people. Rape, slavery, killings, torture, attacks against identity, all manner of persecution and destruction of cultural property take place as we speak. But through the other prism, through the other lens, this court and the whole Rome statute architecture represents, in my view, a promise to the future that tomorrow need not be as bleak, as sorrowful as yesterday. To state parties, with respect, I commend you, every single state that has signed up and ratified the Rome statute for your commitment to international justice, your commitment to fulfill the promise that you have made. And I undertake in my new position as prosecutor to respect the statute, to comply with complementarity and insist on independence. And, and I will endeavor to foster cooperation and collaboration wherever possible. I will endeavor to nurture engagement rather than competition. The priority for me, and I believe that's the principle of the Rome Statute, is not to focus so much on where trials take place, but to ensure that the quest for accountability and inroads on impunity are made. Burden sharing for me is a corollary, of course, to resource limitations but it's also a legal and moral obligation upon all of us, a shared commitment on behalf of humanity of which we have the honor to be part. And together, I really do believe we can make progress and I, steady, I, st I stand steady and willing to engage with states in novel and imaginative ways. Linked to that is my view, Mr. President, that of course the ICC is not only a court of last resort. In my view, and it's a matter for the honorable judges of the court, in my view, the Hague itself should be a city of last resort. Wherever possible, we should be trying to have trials in the country or in the region, wherever possible. Of course, it is easier for survivors and victims. It can save costs reduce the carbon footprint. But also importantly, it shows we're not in the export business. We're not. We are involved in a body of law that is owned by humanity. It is not of the West or of the East. It's not of the global North or of the South. It belongs to each and every one of us. To non-state parties, I say that I wish to include you in my engagement in this joint quest for justice. 
The principles that underpin the Rome Statute also find form in the Charter of the United Nations, in customary international law. Uh, and my conviction is that we can find common ground in the quest and in the imperative to ensure we eradicate genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Civil society remains an essential partner. I've worked with many parts of civil society, and I've seen so many occasions when they work in perilous and dangerous situations, and I need their help. The office needs their help, and we will continue to engage with them. And I pledge to be as collegiate with NGOs, with civil society, and as independent from them as I will with states. Uh, during my term, my aim is to build upon what works, to build on the solid ground that exists, but also to repair what is broken, to rejuvenate, to revive in the quest for greater efficiency and greater impact. To staff, as my predecessor knows very well, you will be my right and my left hand. This office should be the best place in the world for anybody who believes in the rule of law, human rights, international relations to work. And you have a right to work in a harassment free working environment. And I intend to start addressing that, Mr. President, from today. I hope that with the help of the staff, we can make this a reality. In this regard, in my view, the current gender and geographical imbalance in the office, particularly gender imbalance in the highest echelons of the office, must be treated as an urgent operational priority requiring immediate correction. And this is not as some favor to different parts of the world or to women. It's a requirement of good management, it's a requirement of justice, but also it's an essential pillar to improve the performance uh, of the office. Linked to that, staff will become increasingly aware that opening preliminary examinations, requesting authorization or commencing investigations is a start. But as we say in English, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We have to perform in trial. We cannot invest so much. We cannot raise expectations so high and achieve so little so often in the courtroom. As an office, we need a greater realization of what is required by the burden of proof and the obligation to prove a case beyond reasonable doubt. I'm also convinced, and I've said it for years, that if we fully embrace this wonderful gift from the civil law system of Article 54, of investigating, incriminating, and exculpatory evidence equally, so we get to the truth, that is going to be a key component to building stronger cases and getting better results in the courtroom. To the defense, I say, I stand ready for engagement. There is an obligation upon all officers of the court, prosecution and defense, to narrow the issues wherever possible, to find areas of common agreement and ensure that international justice is not dragged out or delayed. And I also stand ready to improve the issue of disclosure so that trials can also be more effective and efficient. The final word, of course, Mr. President, must be to the survivors. The survivors are the heroes of the story that we have the honor to tell. Their indefatigable energy, their stamina and persistence for justice, I have found repeatedly all over the world, stuns one into silence. And it is as humbling, their example is as humbling as it is inspiring. I ask survivors for their patience as we bring about improvements, but I commit at all times, inshallah, to tell them the unvarnished truth. Mr. President, Excellency, 
honourable judges attending remotely, uh, I am truly and sincerely humbled at my opportunity to serve, at the responsibilities that have been entrusted in me, and I will do my utmost to discharge those responsibilities without fear or favour, faithfully and with integrity, and with in full conformity with the solemn declaration that I have just given. Thank you so much.